Hello friends, my name is Lucas Mann and I pastor a church here in Lawrence titled The Spring Church and friends, I come out here this afternoon out of a, a, a great desire to see you saved from your sins, to see you reconciled to God through Jesus Christ. I come out, with, out here with my dear brother John, fellow soldier of the cross, to preach the gospel of grace to you, to bring to you the message of life, to call out sin, to warn you of the, of the wrath of God that is coming upon the wicked, that one day the wrath of God is going to be revealed in His judgment upon those who reject Christ. But for those who find refuge in Christ, for them they shall be received into heaven. They shall be dwelling with God and the holy angels forever. Friends, I come out here to, to preach to you concerning the cross of Jesus Christ and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. What Jesus has procured for His people, what He has brought about in His dying for His church, Friends, the Gospel is glorious. It is the Gospel of the glory of God. The triune God, Father, Son, and Spirit working all things to redound to His glory. Working all things to bring about the good of His elect people. As Romans 8.28 tells us that all things work together for the good of the people of God. And as we know from texts like Romans 11 and in other places like Isaiah 48, that all things are working and redounding to the glory of God. And therefore, through the preaching of the gospel, it is our heart's desire and our prayer that the, the Lord God of hosts, the Lord of glory, Jesus Christ, would be brought all glory and would be exalted today as His gospel is preached and as His gospel is published, as His gospel is proclaimed. Friends, the gospel is so glorious it ought to be proclaimed upon the rooftops, on the street corners. Friends, it ought to be proclaimed everywhere. In the pulpits especially. Somewhere where sadly here in Lawrence County it is very rarely exposited. There is so little gospel preaching in the churches today and therefore we bring it to the streets, friends. Because though you be in church every week, I highly doubt you hear this message preached. This true, offensive, God-centered gospel. The gospel which abases the pride of man, which brings man's pride low and exalts the grace of God in salvation. This gospel is not a popular gospel, for it is hostile to human flesh. It is not a gospel that sinners love because it totally abases their pride. But it is a gospel which the saints of God adore because it exalts the God whom they adore. The text of Scripture that I would like to direct your attention to this afternoon is out of Romans. In Romans chapter 2, as I have been preaching verse by verse this book of Romans, I find myself here today at the end of this chapter. And we're going to look in verse 25. And we're going to finish out the chapter. We're going to read down to verse 29. Paul writes these words under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit of God. Hear the word of the Lord. He writes, For indeed, circumcision is of value if you practice the law. But if you are a transgressor of the law, your circumcision has been regarded as uncircumcision. So if the uncircumcised man keeps the requirements of the law, will not his uncircumcision be regarded as circumcision? And he who is physically uncircumcised if he keeps the law, will he not judge you who though having the letter of the law and circumcision are a transgressor of the law? For he is not a Jew who is one outwardly, nor in circumcision that which is outward in the flesh, but he is a Jew who is one inwardly. And circumcision is that which is of the heart, by the Spirit, not by the letter. And his praise is not from men, but from God. This is a text of Scripture that I would like to make some notes on this afternoon. And the issue that Paul is, is dealing with here in Romans chapter 2 is simply this. Is that outward conformity to a law, outward religiosity, does not mean an inward reality. Outward religious deeds does not mean that one has inward salvation. 
What I mean by that is that if you conform yourself to an outward standard of justice and an outward standard of holiness, does not mean that you are converted, does not mean that you are the child of God, for it is not by that means that you can be justified. This is a glorious paradox, because while that is true, the one who has genuinely been saved inwardly will bear that fruit outwardly in their deeds. But those deeds are never, those actions are never the means of their justification. They are never the means by which they are saved. No, my friends, but they are the result. They are the fruit of salvation, friends. You must understand this. Because it is my fear, and it is not a fear which is unfounded, but a fear which is indeed greatly founded upon the truth of Scripture. It is my fear for you that many of you who go to church, many of you who attend church week in and week out, do not know Christ. You may say that you do, and you may have for many decades attended a Bible-believing church, but you yourselves are lost and on your way to hell. That is because you have an outward conformity to the law of God. You maybe have some outward deeds of righteousness, but not an inward reality, friends. God is concerned about the heart. God is concerned about the heart. God is after the heart. True salvation is that which is in the heart, which is in the inner, inner, inner man. That is why Paul says there, he says, He who is a Jew inwardly, and circumcision is, is that which is of the heart, by the Spirit, not by the letter, and His praise is not from men, but from God. Friends, true religion, true worship of God takes place in the heart of man, and it evidences out in the outward actions of the, of the life of the man or the woman. No one is saved by outward conformity to the law of God. No one is saved by keeping certain rules and regulations, for that is not the way of salvation. That is not the way that a sinner can be saved before God. It is a fruitless endeavor. Because all of us have sinned before God, we have broken His law, we have trampled His commands underfoot. And friends, to try and make ourselves right before God by our deeds is a foolish endeavor, is a fruitless pursuit, because God will not have such a thing. God cannot be bribed, friends. Just as a judge here in Lawrence County or in the state of South Carolina cannot be bribed, cannot be bribed by a criminal. No, the judge must punish the criminal. So it is with God. He must punish the wicked and he will not be bribed by their supposed good deeds. Aside from what the Jehovah's Witnesses will tell you, or the Mormons will tell you, or the Catholics will tell you, friends, salvation is a free gift of the grace of God. It is all out of the mercy of God. It is not by works of the law that we are justified. Paul wrote in the very next chapter, at the end of chapter 3 and verse 28, he says, For we maintain, that is, that we grab hold of, we hold this tightly to our hearts, this article of faith, and it is this, For we maintain that a man is justified by faith apart from the works of the law. Friends, salvation is by believing that God is merciful enough to grant such a glorious gift to such a vile sinner. That is true salvation. It is not an outward thing, but an inward reality that evidences itself in outward conformity to the law of God out of gratitude to God and not out of some compulsion, not out of this great sense of, well, I must perform lest I be lost. No, but it is a sense of saying in one's heart, because I have been saved by the grace and mercy of God, I will perform and I will work to the glory of the one who has saved me from my sin. And so, these truths and others is what I would like to consider as we go through this passage this afternoon. And ultimately, I'd like to consider the gospel of grace that changes the inward man, that changes the heart. The gospel of Jesus Christ, which is offensive, yes, but saves sinners from their sins. The gospel which changes the man inwardly, which makes him a new creation. The gospel which is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. It is the dynamis of God. The powerful, explosive, life-changing power of God upon the life of the sinner. And so let us consider those truths this afternoon. But before we do, I'd like to consider the context of where Paul has come from and where Paul is ultimately going here in Romans chapter 2. 
he is in this chapter as a whole calling out the the hypocrisy of the religious the pride of the religious thinking that they themselves are good enough to make it to heaven that they can placate God that they can bribe him by their good deeds he points the finger to them and says, No, you just like the pagan, just like the atheist, just like the unchurched, just like the agnostic evolutionist, you as well are lost and you need salvation just as much as they do. That's why he says in verse 1, Therefore, you have no excuse, every one of you who passes judgment, for in that which you judge another, you condemn yourself. For you who judge practice the same things. Verse 3, But do you suppose this, O man, when you pass judgment on those who practice such things and do the same yourself, that you will escape the judgment of God? The answer, of course, is no. Because he says down in verse 6, that God will render to each person according to his deeds. In fact, he gets so bold so as to quote an Old Testament passage in verse 24 of this chapter, right before the verse which we just read, verse 25, he says, For the name of God is blasphemed among the Gentiles because of you, just as it is written. In other words, the hypocrisy of the religious causes the non-religious to blaspheme the name of God, the name of Jesus Christ, because they are hypocrites. So too with you who go to church but do not live for Christ. You cause the pagan, you cause those who do not attend church and do not care of the things of God to blaspheme God. You cause them to, to trample the name of Christ underfoot because you say you have something. You say you have Christ, but you do not live as though you have Christ. And therefore you are self-deceived as I was for many years. Self-deluded, lost in my sin, thinking I myself was converted, but I was truly deceived, truly lost. And thankfully, God did a work in my heart to save me. And that's what I am hoping and trusting that if God so wills, He will do that work in your heart today as well for His glory. So that therefore brings us, at the end of verse 24, it leads right into verse 25, which is what we are considering this afternoon. That ultimately, an outward conformity to commands does not change the heart and does not justify the sinner. That's why it says in verse 25, For indeed, circumcision is of value if you practice the law. But if you are a transgressor of the law, your circumcision has become uncircumcision. In other words, Paul is addressing an issue which was very, very prevalent in his day. The Jewish people claimed to have the true God, claimed to have the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, but they rejected his son. They had outward conformity to rules, but not the inward reality of salvation. In fact, Jesus called the religious elite of his day in Matthew 23. He said, you are whitewashed tombs filled with, with dead men's bones. It's because they on the outside performed well, but inwardly they were lost. Inwardly they did not have salvation as they claimed they did. They did not have salvation in the heart and in the soul. That's why he says your circumcision has become uncircumcision. In other words, what you claimed to have outwardly means nothing before God. In fact, it's now an offense to God. He continues in verse 26, So if the uncircumcised man keeps the requirements of the law, will not his uncircumcision be regarded as circumcision? In other words, if you keep the law of God perfectly, you'll be regarded as perfect in the eyes of God. But the problem is, such a man does not exist. Such a woman does not exist. For no one can keep the law of God as God demands. No one can perform as God demands that we perform. He says in verse 27, and he who is physically uncircumcised, if he keeps the law, will he not judge you who, though having the letter of the law and circumcision, are a transgressor of the law? And this is true again, as I said, this speaks to that reality that there are many unreligious people who do not go to church, who look upon people who do attend church and who are hypocrites, and they judge them. They look upon them and say, those Christians... Whatever they claim to have, they truly do not have it because their religion is powerless. God bless you, ma'am. Their religion is lifeless. 
And such people who say that are right. Because those supposed Christians truly do have a religion that is powerless. It's false religion. It's pseudo-Christianity. It's not true salvation. Many people on the day of judgment will say to Jesus, Lord, Lord, they know Him as Lord. And they will say, look at my deeds, Lord Jesus. And He will say to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. Jesus will turn away many on the day of judgment who in this life claim to be His followers, but truly were not. Verse 28, He says, For He is not a Jew who is one outwardly, nor is circumcision that which is outward in the flesh, but He is a Jew who is one inwardly, and circumcision is that which is of the heart. Friends, the issue Paul again was dealing with in his day was the Jewish people saying they had God, but they did not trust in Christ for salvation. They were false. They had false religion. And this is applicable to people in church today. It's about the inward reality. Are you a new creation inwardly? Has God done a work in you? And has that evidence in your outward deeds? For if not, then you're lost. It doesn't matter how long you've been in church. It doesn't matter if your parents or your family or your spouse are in church. If you've never been born again, I say in the words of my Lord Jesus, you cannot see the kingdom of God. It is, uh, it is impossible for you who are lost and who are unregenerate to understand spiritual things. Friends, if you've never been born from on high, then my friends, I tell you this, you will be damned from on high. You will be cast into hell for your sins. Flee to Christ, friends. Be born from above. Let the Spirit of God circumcise your hard hearts that you might be saved from your sins. Flee to Christ for eternal life. For He has purchased salvation for His people by His precious blood at the cross. He continues in verse 29. He says, By the Spirit, my friends, the Spirit of God is the author of salvation. It is not the will of man. Away with this false theology of decisionalism away with this man-centered gospel salvation is not something of the will it is not something by free choice it is by the spirit of god it is not by the will of man paul writes in romans 9 16 it is therefore he says it is not for the man who wills the man who runs but on god who has mercy my friend salvation depends upon the will of god not the will of man god has not done all that he can do and then leaves it all the rest up to you no god is sovereign in salvation and i will scream it from the rooftops god is the sovereign agent my friend salvation is not up to some some false will of man some free will as preachers talk about it is of the sovereign grace of god God is sovereign in salvation. And He has the prerogative to do so. To be sovereign over the souls of men. That's why in, in, in John 1.12 it says, But as many as received Him, that is Christ, to them He gave the right to become children of God, even to those who believe in His name. But listen to verse 13. Who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. Friends, my friends, I tell you this. That salvation is of the free will of God. Preachers talk about free will. I believe in free will, but it is the free will of God, not the free will of man. The will of man is bound only to sin, sin, and sin. He is dead in sin, as Ephesians 2 tells us, and dead people cannot do anything. Dead people cannot react to stimuli. Friends, God is the sovereign agent in salvation. And God has the prerogative, the divine prerogative, to do as He wills with His creation. He is the potter and we are the clay in His hands. And therefore, therefore let no man resist the will of God, for no man can. No man can stay His hand, His sovereign hand, which brings about His divine purposes for His own glory. Salvation is all of the free sovereign will of God so that God gets all the glory, friends. God bless you, ma'am. Praise God. Salvation is all for the glory of God. God is jealous, my friends. God is a jealous God. And He is jealous for His glory. His glory He will not share with another, as Isaiah 48 tells us. Oh, my friends, He is zealous for His glory. And therefore, in the economy of salvation, salvation is all 
of the Lord. Even the prophet Jonah in Jonah 2.9 uh, 2, said that in his prayer to God. He said, salvation is of Yahweh. Truly it is. Hallelujah. That salvation is of the Lord. He continues, Paul writes in Romans 2 verse 29, he says, not by the letter, and his praise is not from men, but from God. The genuinely regenerate child of God. God bless you, ma'am. You have a good afternoon. Praise the Lord. The genuinely regenerate child of God, my friends, does not care about the accolades or praise of men. No, his concern is with the praise that is due unto him by God. Not that he earned it. No, it is not this praise as we talk about the, the praise we ascribe to God, but approval, approval from God. He is seeking approval from His Heavenly Father out of gratitude for His salvation. That is the true um, measure of eternal life. Do you, do you desire that? Do you desire to receive approval from God rather than approval from men? That is good evidence that perhaps you are converted and know Christ truly. But briefly, my friends, who is this God that is spoken of in these passages? He is the triune God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. The God of Israel reigns, my friends. He is the sovereign Lord. All kingdoms are subordinate to His. And His rule over the universe shall not be resisted by any man. My friends, He is holy, 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 as Isaiah 6 tells us. Righteous in all His ways, just in all His deeds. Nahum chapter 1 says in verse 2, the Lord is a, a jealous and avenging God. Is the Lord. The Lord is avenging and wrathful. The Lord takes vengeance on His adversaries and reserves wrath for His enemies. God is a just and holy and righteous God. It is true that God is gracious and God is compassionate. That He is abounding in loving kindness. That is true. But these attributes of God never neglect the others. They never contradict one another. God, my friends, God is a holy God. We must understand this. You religious folk, you must grasp this. Many of you do not. Many of you do not because you've been sitting under weak preaching. Not true biblical preaching, my friends and not God-centered preaching. Not theocentric preaching. Preaching that seeks to exalt God and to abase the pride of man. Friends, I tell you, God is a holy God. And in God's holiness, God has given us His law to obey. The triune God has authored the law, the, the Ten Commandments of God. In Exodus 20, we find these commands listed out for us. God says in verse 3, You shall have no other gods before me. In other words, that is the sin of idolatry. God forbids idol worship, my friends. That is, worshiping another god, or creating a god who suits your own desires, or worshiping something else rather than your creator, rather than the true God of Abraham. He says in verse 7, You shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain, for the Lord will not leave him unpunished who takes his name in vain. And then down a few verses later, it says in verse 16, You shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. Friends, these are just three out of the Ten Commandments that God gave, and they show us the character of God. They show us the perfection of God's character, that God is a jealous and holy God, that God is not a liar, that God is not perverse. These reflect to us the law of God is like a mirror and it reflects to us a glorious picture of the character of God. And then secondly, it shows us the filth of our character in light of the character of God. The perfection of God's law is there for a purpose, friends, and it is not there for our salvation. No one can be saved by keeping the law of God. No one can be saved by performing good enough, for no one is good enough to make it to heaven by their materious works. My friends, the law of God is there to show us that we are sinners in the hands of an angry God, that we are sinners before the Holy One of Israel. That's why Romans 3.20 says, For through the law comes the knowledge of sin. We know what sin is, friends, because of the law of God. And when we consider those commands, we see that our, we ourselves are lawbreakers. For we have committed idolatry. You know that you have committed idolatry in your heart. That you have worshipped other things rather than the Creator. That you have worshipped a false God in your own heart. 
Or we consider the command, you shall not blaspheme. You know that you have blasphemed God. I know that I myself in my own life have taken God's name and used it in vain. Friends, that is a heinous, a grievous evil in the eyes of God. And you know that you have lied. I myself have lied. And just these three commands, we see the greatness of our guilt. We see the greatness of our evil before God. All the way to the core of our being, we are corrupt by sin. That's why in Genesis 6, 5, it says, Then the Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great on the earth, and that every intent of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. Friends, our heart is deceitful and wicked. Don't listen to Disney. Your heart is something that ought not be followed. It is perverse, friends. It is a perverse thing. We are corrupt to the core. And we are not to follow our feelings or to follow our own gut feeling or inclination or our own hearts because we are susceptible to deceive ourselves, friends. And because of our sin before God, what is the divine sentence? The divine sentence that has been passed upon all those who reject Christ is hell. Hell fire for the wicked, my friends. Hell is the place of weeping and gnashing of teeth. The place of punishment for the enemies of God. Jesus described hell as a place of an unquenched fire the place of outer darkness friends and that is the place where God administers his wrath upon the wicked where God pours forth his judgment upon the ungodly and I don't want you to go there friends I don't want you to go to hell in your sins please flee to Christ for eternal life flee to Jesus so that you would be saved from your sins that you would be saved sir even you that you'd be born from above and cleansed oh my friends you need eternal life you need it desperately and so truly we are hopeless and no amount as I've said before of law keeping can make us right with God because that never takes away our guilt the guilt is still there and so we find ourselves in this hopeless state. However, my friends, the gospel of the, of the scriptures, the good news of Jesus Christ is that he came into the world to save sinners. I love what the angel told Joseph in, in Matthew chapter 1 and verse 21. He said to Joseph, she, that, be, that was Mary, she will bear a son and you shall call his name Jesus for he will save his people from their sins. Jesus saves sinners, my friends, and he came into the world, the second person of the Trinity, eternal God, truly God, truly man. He dwelt in our midst, my friends, and he fulfilled the law of God. He fulfilled the commands of God that we have trampled underfoot. Every command that we see there in Exodus 20 and in elsewhere in Scripture, Christ fulfilled them. Christ kept them. Christ obeyed them. He was not an idolater or a blasphemer or never was he a liar, my friends. He was perfect, perfect, my friends, in all his ways. That's why the scripture says in Matthew 3, 17, that the Father declared from heaven, this is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. Oh, my friends, Christ in his performance was absolutely perfect. And then he laid himself down for the people of God. He laid himself down, my friends, at the cross of Calvary, was beat and whipped and spat upon. He was made a public mockery and he bore the wrath of God against the sins of the people of God. The father counted him as if he was guilty, though he was innocent. The Father credited Jesus with having committed the sins that we have committed, the church has committed. Jesus died for His bride. Jesus died for His people, the church of God, and He satisfied the wrath of God against sin. Away with this notion that Jesus died for every person. Jesus did not. Jesus died for His church. His death is an exclusive death. It is not for every person. Jesus' death upon the cross is a very exclusive death. And it was only for His people. You may ask, well then how can I know that, I have, that I'm included in this great multitude of people? The simple answer is, believe upon the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. Then you will know that you are in this great host of people. Then you will know that you are in this host of people because you believe upon Christ, because He's given you the gift of faith. So my friends, at the cross, as Isaiah 53.10 says, 
It says in verse 10 there, but the Lord was pleased to crush him. It satisfied the wrath of the Father to crush his son at the cross. And Jesus did it to the uttermost. And then after three days in the tomb, after paying for our sins of the cross, he was laid in that tomb for three days. And then the Father rose him up from the dead. He rose him up as the public display that he had received his sacrifice as a sufficient payment for our sins. That Christ's work at the cross was enough to purchase our salvation. Friends, this is glorious. Glorious. Glorious is the gospel of grace. Jesus is alive today and forevermore. Death will never have power over Him and He will never die again. He is the true God in eternal life. The living God. And He is worthy of your worship. So here's what the sinner must do. The sinner must repent and believe the gospel. That's two things. Repentance is simply seeing that one is a sinner that they have sinned against God, that they cannot earn their salvation by their work. And they, they flee to Christ. They run from their sin and they trust alone in Jesus. And then belief is simply just that. It is a trust. It's a belief. It's a grabbing hold of the promises of God as they're revealed in Scripture, my friends. It is a believing that what God has said concerning Jesus' Son is true. And friends, for the sinner who does that, God will forgive them of all their sin, past, present, and future. And God will look upon them as if they lived the life, the perfect life of Jesus Christ. He will credit them with having lived Christ's life because Christ was credited with having lived theirs. Jesus takes my sin, I get His righteousness. That's the glorious invitation of the Gospel. And it is all by grace, all by the grace of God. And friends, for the one who is truly saved, they will bear fruit of this. Their life will be changed radically. My friends, and this gospel is not only for the, the unconverted, but for the converted. For the saints, my friends, this gospel is for the church, for Christians. My fellow saints, I encourage you to rest upon the gospel today and to preach it to your family members and friends for the rest of your life, for the glory of God. It's all by the grace of God so that God gets all the glory. It's all for the glory of God. All things are for the glory of God. That's why Romans 11 says, For from Him and through Him and to Him are all things. To Him be the glory forever. Amen. My friends, it is my strong exhortation to you that you would repent and believe on Christ, that you would flee your sin, that you would flee to Christ, that you would believe upon Him, that you would find hope in the Son of God. And you religious people, I encourage you to examine yourselves, you churchgoers, to look at your lives and see whether you're truly in the faith. Ask yourself, do I bear good fruit or am I simply a hypocrite? And if you see that you are lost, I encourage you to flee to Christ truly. To repent for the first time unto salvation. And for Christians... Rest in this gospel and preach this gospel for the rest of your lives for the glory of God. So in conclusion, we've seen here in Romans 2, in verses 25 through 29, that outward conformity to a law, outward conformity to the law of God, will not change the heart and does not justify a soul, does not justify man before God. It is only the inward reality of salvation that is true salvation. And we have seen here today that yes, we have sinned. We have all sinned before God. And we deserve hell for our sin. But God sent His Son into the world, Jesus Christ, to purchase salvation for the people of God, to procure eternal redemption. And it is all by grace. Jesus died and rose again on behalf of sinners. And His salvation which He provides is all by grace. So that God gets all the glory. To God be the glory indeed. Both now and today and forevermore. And in all things, as all things redound to the glory of God, my friends. To God be the glory indeed. Forever. Amen. Amen.